So I got a dose of reality the other day because, uh, check this, I was literally one night's work of editing away from finishing my Streets of Rage 4 review because, as you guys have been following along, I've been doing a sort of retrospective series on the Streets of Rage games. I really was about to finish it, and then all of a sudden, a brand new DLC trailer dropped, which featured a bunch of new additions from new weapons to new characters to play as, and possibly some other fixes that were definitely, at least in my eyes, necessary. Now, ordinarily, I probably would have just gone ahead and released my review as is, but the more I thought about it, I did have some concerns and some problems with the overall game. Not to say that Streets of Rage 4 is... Well, it, you'll see. But I, the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, the DLC add-on that they are announcing right now could very well address some of the problems and concerns that I had. So other than just putting the video out there and making it completely irrelevant by the time the DLC dropped, I decided the wiser thing to do would probably be just to hold it off and wait till the DLC came out. I played it and had some new footage to go along with it and to see if any of the additions changed my mind about certain aspects of uh, the game that I thought were a little not goodish. But that being said, uh, I was still in a Sega mood, and instead of just holding off altogether and giving you guys nothing, I found out that there was another game that dropped called Balin and Something Something Wonder World. <laughs> yeah, forgive me if the title isn't stuck in my head yet. I haven't exactly played it, but I have seen it. In fact, I remember when Gene and I first saw that Balin game, we were immediately hit with some nostalgia vibes because it's cl very clear what inspired that game and it was actually no surprise when eventually i found out that the man directing and probably even behind that game altogether was our yuji naka of sega fame who was of course behind sonic the hedgehog and a part of the knights into dreams franchise so naturally uh being the knights fan that i am i felt this was a perfect opportunity for me to finally go back and finish what i started Sadly, a couple of years ago, <laughs> but better late than never. And you know what? This is finally presenting me with an opportunity to talk about it. So you know what? Let's finish this and talk about Night's Journey of Dreams, uh, a game that I still have a lot of feelings for. And I'm glad that we're finally going to talk about it without wasting any more of your time. But hey, you're watching one of my videos. Wasting your time is what I do. Let's just hop right in and talk about Knights and go back into the world of Nightopia and see if this game holds up the way I think it does. Now before we begin, I want to let you guys know in advance that if you haven't seen my videos on Christmas Nights or the original Nights into Dreams for the Sega Saturn, I strongly suggest that you visit those videos first, as this review is technically the third part in the series. And also I'm really proud of those videos, so yeah, go back and check them out. No, it's okay, you can pause the video here and I'll wait, alright? So cool, we're back. So after the release and considerable success of Knights into Dreams, the character Knights was arguably a new icon for the company of Sega to boast having. In fact, it's reasonable to assume that if the Sega Saturn had to have an iconic character, Knights would definitely be the one. A couple of years after the original game's release, Archie Comics, who was in a good standing with Sega, and still is as far as I know, attempted to make a comic book adaptation of the original game. Naturally, being Archie Comics, and frankly not having much to go on in terms of narrative, again, see my previous video, the writers opted to take what facts they did know about the game and fill in the blanks themselves, essentially creating their own canon. The first three issues they released were received pretty well, as the story they crafted around the characters was interesting on its own, and fans felt it was also cleverly done and remained faithful to what they knew to be true in the video game. However, 
This, sadly, would not last long, as when Archie renewed the series for three more issues, six in total, the next three comics were the exact opposite in what fans were expecting. The artwork had apparently declined in quality, and the story itself suddenly became a nonsensical mess that prompted Archie to discontinue the story from advancing any further. And, you know, sadly, despite Knight's original success, the same could not be said for the Sega Saturn as a whole, or Sega for that matter. Poor business practices relating to the 32X and the Sega CD and the Sega Saturn were very costly mistakes that Sega would struggle to rebound from. Their reputation, at least as far as America was concerned, was beginning to fail. The tale is as old as time now, but the late 90s and early 2000s were not kind. Because Sega was in the midst of trying to save their company in the console wars with the Sega Dreamcast and Sonic the Hedgehog leading the way, Knights sadly fell by the wayside and, over time, faded into obscurity. Knights would continue on to make cameos here and there, like in the pinball section of Sonic Adventure and other little things in other games, but beyond that, it didn't feel like fans of the Knight Dimension were going to get much more than that. Takashi Izuka, who was the lead programmer of Knights, detailed at some point that there were originally plans to work on a sequel to the game during the Saturn and Dreamcast era. Yet ultimately, as we know, nothing really came of it. And what ideas they did have, technologically, ended up being used in other Sega games instead, like Samba de Amigo. Years went by, and aside from a few well-made hoaxes that floated about on the internet fooling people, including myself, that a sequel was happening, it really didn't appear to be that way from the official side of things. At least, until Nintendo of all companies teased fans that a sequel was going to be happening for the Nintendo Wii. Fans were pretty speculatory and weren't really sure if this was just another hoax, but a Portuguese magazine that had a redesigned Knights right on the front cover added some levity that this was actually happening. Soon, there was no question. Scans and screenshots of the game and development surfaced, and just like that, 11 years after the original game, Knights Journey of Dreams was officially debuted. I remember when this all happened and was really excited. The mid-2000s was a tough time for me as a Knights fan. I didn't have a functioning Sega Saturn or a copy of the original game or the 3D controller. And shoot, trying to afford all three of those back then for me might as well have been like trying to find a PlayStation 5 today in 2021. Hell, emulation at the time also wasn't really a possibility because <laughs> even if I did have a decent computer, I don't think there was a functionally good Sega Saturn emulator yet. Actually, I'm still not sure if there is. The case in point, the fact is that a brand new Knight's experience was around the corner for a console I actually did have at the time, and it was a thrill to behold. Finally, the Day of Reckoning was here. Knight's Journey of Dreams was released, and while everybody else was going to GameStop, EB Games, or Walmart to buy probably something else, I was going to the nearest blockbuster to rent, copy, back up, and burn my own copy of Knights for my then-modded Nintendo Wii, because the sad reality is I was a poor teenager with no job, and don't judge me, I did buy the game eventually. So, now that the whole setup is out of the way, we can finally talk about Knights Journey of Dreams. I'll start off by getting the big question out of the way, right now. Do I think Knights Journey of Dreams is a good game? The short answer, yes. The long answer, it's complicated. Hey, are you ready? So, presentation and production-wise, Journey of Dreams feels like it actually had a modest budget. The opening CG cutscenes are pretty slick. Elliot and Claris are no longer in the picture, but this time we have two new protagonists, Will and Helen. Like before, you can select which of the kids you want to follow, and each of them have their own story arc and their own levels. Also like Elliot and Claris before them, Will and Helen have their own personal issues, which is the focus of their adventure. One thing I will say about the story outright is that it's really not meant to be taken too seriously. It's very much presented as a Saturday morning cartoon. It's charming and it is fun, but little things like character motivations aren't really clear, and there is a bit of an abundance of MacGuffins. There's one moment later in Helen's campaign specifically that bugs the hell out of me, and it really is one of those plot devices that's never brought up again. We'll get to that shortly. The continuity also gets a little loose with time and the when and the where, and there's even an alternative and extended ending depending on how you finish the game. 
That being said, spoiler warning now, because we're diving in head first, guys. Introducing Will. He is a young soccer player who loves his father and the time they spend together practicing. Sadly, Will is troubled when his father has to take a distant and possibly lengthy business trip. For this reason, Will feels discouraged because without his dad to support him, he feels he won't have the courage to succeed in the upcoming games. Meanwhile, Helen, on the other side of town, is practicing the violin with her mother for an upcoming concert they are to perform. Helen's problem is that she keeps getting distracted and blowing her mother off to instead hang out with her friends. As this keeps happening, Helen does begin to feel upset because of what she's done. I'm sorry. Jesus Christ! Naturally, this anxiety and regret invades both Will and Helen's dreams and begins to attack them. Thankfully, just like before, a shining light saves them leading them to the night dimension. Now, from my understanding, both stories are more or less handled the same way Sonic Adventure 2 handled its story. They both don't start at the same time, but they do reach the finale together. Contextually, I think Helen's story is the one that begins a little bit before Will's does, and that's only predicated just on how the other characters like knights react when they see them. When both kids arrive at the Dream Gate, which is like the hub for visitors who manage to get there during sleep, a new character named Owl greets them. Owl's purpose isn't exactly known. He really just acts as an exposition dump for the audience and a tutorial for people who've probably never played a video game before. And I swear, he's <laughs> just like Oma Chow from the Sonic games, cause he never shuts up. Customary procedure in such cases is as follows. The thing to do is as follows. The thing to do is... You have such a talent for speaking and telling us what to do. Thankfully, this is also where Knights gets reintroduced. Oh, well, it isn't that carefree little rascal again. Hey, now this one looks interesting. My name is Knights. What's yours? One point of contention, I remember being a hot topic when this game came out, people were not feeling Jalisa Aguera's voice as Knights. Now, it's not that she gave a bad performance. Honestly, all the actors in this game do a credible job, especially given what they're working with, that is. But I think Jalisa's obvious female voice wasn't exactly what fans of Knights were expecting this character to sound like, especially after 11 years of being almost mute. We already knew that Knights was, again, genderless and a creature of the dream world, although canonically referred to as he and him, even in this game. And while I admit, even I didn't expect that to be his voice, I know it's common in writing in different cultures, especially Japanese, that they often like to give their hero slash innocent type characters a light and less masculine voice to show that they are innocent in nature, which I can totally get behind and I understood this even back in 2007. So while Knight's voice was very feminine, I think Jalisa actually did a good job in giving him a whimsical, cheerful, and carefree voice that Knight's, by nature, I think was supposed to have. And in a way, I think it's sort of become iconic, and at this point I can't really imagine him without it now. Okay, that and having my name in this game sharing the name with one of the kids, Will, whilst hearing Knight's constantly refer to that name does kind of give me a nice giggle. What do you want? I'm biased. Let's go, Will. Knights cheerfully greets each kid and encourages them to try flying around with him, aka duelizing. Duelize. If you recall what I said about Knights in the first game, despite him being the title character, he wasn't really designed with much of a personality to begin with, and his only description was that he enjoyed being around those that have a strong sense of courage which is my explanation on why he likes to hang around the Dream Gate, since those that manage to appear here usually hold on to their idea of courage. After the individual kids get acquainted with Al and Knights, it's revealed that somehow each kid, while sleeping, has indeed managed to hold on to their idea. This allows them to visit Nightopia and explore the fantasies of their mind. 
It's here in these realms where the kids and knights grow stronger bonds with one another as they talk about their problems and play with the small nightopians that roam the dreams. Unfortunately, the Nightmarins, like in the last game, are not content with things and aim to take control of Nightopia to further their own agenda for Master Wiseman, the creator of all Nightmare. None more so than his main underling, Riala who we met before and is a more sinister version of Knights, who routinely tries to either pick a fight with our purple hero or capture him to convert him back into being a Nightmarin the way he apparently used to be. Riala and Helen's story tries to drive a wedge between her and Knights, using that fact as a means to an end. Helen questions this at first, but Riala explains that those who wear the Persona mask wear it as a sign of loyalty to Master Wiseman. And then he asks Helen if she's seen Knights wear the mask at all before, which she has, for one throwaway cutscene towards the beginning of Helen's story. Knights actually does show up wearing that mask for no real reason, and when Helen questions him about it, Knights more or less gives a non-answer and then they just move on. This is the part I was talking about that bugged me, because there never is an answer to this. After all is said and done, despite her doubt, she still chooses to believe that Knights is her friend, with a little encouragement from Will, who she runs into on a couple of occasions. Oh, uh, yeah, I should mention, apparently it's uncommon for visitors to encounter one another in the Night Dimension. But because of Riala trying to paraloop them out of existence, he accidentally warps each kid to the other's fantasy. Will was the first to get transported where he met Helen for the first time in the Crystal Palace maze. Later, Helen got into the same predicament but was hurt in the process, forcing Will to escort her to safety where he rejuvenized her faith. Someone who I thought was my friend. Well, I guess we weren't such good friends after all. Oh, so, so I... You need to believe in your friends, Helen. You said you were good friends, right? Then you've got to believe in them. If you trust in your friends, then that trust is sure to get through. Maybe this is why you and I ran into each other again. Well, thank you. I... I'll try to keep that trust. Because we are friends. Yeah! Thank you so much, Will. Do you think we'll ever see each other again? I'm sure we will. If you trust that we will. You're right. I'm sure we will. See you later, Helen. Okay, see you. Even after Helen returned and helped Knights yet again free the Nightopians from her fantasy, she still doesn't pursue any answers out of Knights as to why he was wearing the mask. Ultimately, it really doesn't matter because we know that Knights isn't the bad guy. Still, I felt that this was kind of a sloppy way to handle a plot thread that was a little more than contrivance and didn't really go anywhere. Oh, whatever. Will and Helen within their own realms help knights fight off the Nightmarins from taking over and routinely beat them out of their fantasies, gaining back more of their lost idia when they do so. However, the idia beyond recovering them don't really serve any real purpose to the overall narrative, nor are they brought up again, really. The only exception to this is when you complete both stories and repeat the final battle for the extended ending. The idea of hope is more or less held ransom by wise men and treated like it's the most important one, which is fine. But again, given that these orbs were said to be of real importance, at least according to the first game's manual, I just find it a little weird that the villains don't really appear to be making them a priority, and frankly neither do the heroes. Throughout the story, for both Will and Helen, all that really happens for each world you visit is the kids see a new fantasy, they talk about their problems and what the fantasy represents is wrong in real life, Riala shows up and drops some threats, Knights ends up getting captured, oh joy, Kid helps break him out and defeats a boss, you f with the cowardly octopus, save some Nightopians in a unique way, repeat the same boss fight you just had a few moments earlier, only harder this time, and repeat that for three worlds until it all comes to a head in the finale. I know it sounds like I'm harping and being critical and negative, and yes, look, the plot is definitely not Shakespeare. It's just that, given all the inspiration that we know went into the creation of this series from the start, and what this game sets up, it actually does have some interesting plot ideas and goes into some very real dilemmas we not just as kids, 
but even adults struggle with. Fears like always feeling like you possibly have to cling to somebody to give you the strength that you need because you're too afraid to stand on your own, or even acknowledging that you may have to look at yourself once in a while and realize that you have responsibilities and need to take into consideration how others could feel when you neglect them. That's what I see when I play a game like this, and it's nice when you get those moments where each character does talk about it when they get the chance. It's just that the game as a whole doesn't really allow itself to explore these moments deeper. Ah, I, I feel like it's there. It's just, I don't know if they didn't have enough time or if Sega or Sonic Team opted out because they wanted to play it safe and go for something simpler, or who knows. But despite how simple and even a little repetitive the story is, I swear I feel like there's a tiny hint of brilliance in it that I wish I could have gotten to see explored more. If Sega just had a team of writers to really flesh out the already rich lore the series has. That being said, for what we did get as a story, it it's not bad. It's just simple, which, if you think about it, in of itself is probably its biggest crime. I'll cover the finale in the end, but before that, let's talk about the gameplay. If you know anything about knights and you saw my first video, well, you got flying and you got rings. You put the two together and that's more or less what you're getting. Just more of it. No, but in all seriousness, there have been some changes and, dare I say, improvements to the original. Journey of Dreams, to put it simply, takes every foundation the first game started with and just adds to it. Instead of a level select, you now have a little hub world. In the first game, each character had three different levels. Now, each one has three different worlds containing five levels for each world. In the original, there was a unique boss fight for each stage. Journey of Dreams has some original and reimagined bosses that fit the same mold. The biggest change, of course, is longevity. Where the original game had only about seven unique levels, not including bosses, Journey of Dreams has a total of 25. Both can technically be completed in one sitting, but I feel that Journey of Dreams does offer more in terms of replay value. Now, each world is going to provide you with levels where you as knights will fly through a wide obstacle course, chaining up combos by gathering rings and orbs in a timely manner. The more of a chain you build up, the higher your overall point total will be. If you get a high enough score, you will be rewarded with a good rank when the stage comes to an end. Fortunately, friends, this is not Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, or any other Sonic game for that matter, so getting a good rank or even an A rank, should not be that difficult. But it could take you a few tries depending on the level and how well you perform. In fact, I would say it's also not as hard as the first game either when it comes to points. After all, earning a high score was your primary objective in the first game. Here in the sequel, getting at least a rank C is still demanded, but you won't have to try too hard to obtain it. The points, while nice if you feel the need to keep score, which is still very much a thing you can do, is not much of a requirement anymore, as your main goal in the stages is usually just to complete an objective that the level gives you. And while a good chunk of the stages will of course involve knights flying, not all stages will be built the same. Some will require knights to paraloop Nightopians to safety, the more you save, the better your rank, and there are other levels that have knights take on another form, like a boat or a roller coaster, where the objective is somewhat similar, save Nightopians or stop a collision. Other levels, like catch the jewels as they fall, play the knights theme via a forest orchestra, which is harder than it looks, let me tell you. Cock my mother son of can't believe it, mother suck it, I hate it. There's the Octopus stages, which are all about getting a high score, trying to build up the biggest chain of ring combos you can. And then there's the main stages, where you have to catch up to the Nightmarins holding the keys, which is followed by a stage boss. Complete and defeated quickly to achieve a good rank. And then there's levels where you play as the kids themselves, exploring or making your way through a labyrinth, trying to fight your way to the end by solving some minuscule puzzles or finding some hidden chests or secrets along the way, while platform jumping to the end goal. While flying as knights, there are some abilities you can take advantage of. Depending on the controller you're using, which, in my opinion, really should be the GameCube controller, by pressing the L and R buttons while flying, knights can use his ribbon ability from the first game. However, whereas in the previous adventure, the ribbon was just a quick power-up to get some bonus points, here in Journey of Dreams, it's a permanent power-up that on top of being stylish can allow for quick turns in any direction you point knights to, which can make it much easier to paraloop a trail of rings, orbs, or just about anything, and is a very good strategy to use often, and I think it's a welcome change. Throughout stages, while paralooping enemies and orbs, and generally performing well, the game will give knights some other temporary power-ups, one of which I really like that extends the range of your particle effects. If you recall, 
Knight's main method of attack is the paraloop, meaning flying into a circle and collecting his sparks, anything caught in between will be sucked up into the void, adding to your points. And your natural spark range isn't that far, so that's where using those quick turn strats actually help out more. But the power-up that extends the range does come in handy when you get it. There do exist other power-ups, like a time stop, but they are a little few and far in between to be useful, and I never really used them that much. As you complete worlds, you are rewarded with Persona Masks for knights that you can use to change his form during a stage such as the Dolphin Mask, which allows you to go underwater, the Rocket Mask, which you can use to blast your way at some breakneck speeds, or the Dragon Mask, which you can use to kinda slither around stages and blow through anything. I gotta admit, I almost forgot to even mention these masks, because outside of very specific moments, I almost never use them. The Dolphin one just kinda uses itself automatically every time you go in a body of water, so it's almost not worth mentioning as it's automatic. However, the other masks do have their purpose, and sure, they can be helpful in specific circumstances and things like that, but I was pretty efficient with just the basic flying that I never felt like I needed to use them for anything. However, the rocket one especially does come in handy during some boss fights. Interestingly, when it comes to flying in this game, I find it's actually much easier than it used to be. And I figured it out, and it's because I like that the camera is actually pointed at a little bit of an isometric angle, facing the oncoming rings and obstacles, so you can better prepare for what you have to do. I also think that the added widescreen even helps give you a little bit more of a perspective to see along the area. This is unfortunately where the original game suffered more, at least for me, because the camera was always pointed directly at you like a traditional platformer, which for a game like Knights, I find to be a little problematic because it's a game where you have to traverse an obstacle course and you're sadly blind to most of it. The only way you were bound to get any good at it was repeating playthroughs enough to the point that you were inevitably just gonna memorize it all. Which, back in the 90s, you could have probably gotten away with, but by 2007 standards, we definitely got a grasp on some things that are a must. And obscuring the player's view with a poorly positioned camera is not going to win you any prizes. Thankfully, Knight's Journey of Dreams makes traversing these courses not only fair, because, well, you can actually see what's in front of you, but even during times where the game or the camera does focus itself somewhere else, usually for spectacle reasons, your view is never obscured, and what you need to focus on is usually an eye shot. And don't get me wrong, as much as a shill and a fan I am of the original game, I am not afraid to call something out when it's messed up, or hasn't aged well. On another added bonus I enjoy about Journey of Dreams, it's... honestly, it's just the level design. One thing Sega really has an advantage of with a game like this is just the complete nonsensical fantasy type setting that they can have fun with. And I absolutely love it! Just about every single stage in this game is vibrant and colorful and visually pleasing to the eye with some neat gimmicks to keep you on your toes or to just visually please you, which in of itself can be a little distracting, but in a good way. From the beautiful Jewel Kingdom to the Neon City, the Enchanted Forest, the Water World, even the final stage where you fly through the city making your way to the Clock Tower. I mean, come on! You sitting there watching this video right now have to admit, just looking at this, you can definitely say it's pretty. Eh, for the most part. Yeah, yeah, while the level designs I can say are pretty top notch, some of the character models are a little... awkward. I don't know what is going on here with Owl's textures, but his feathers are constantly phasing in between each other, and what can I say, it looks terrible. I don't know how that got past any screen test, but if I were working on this game back then, I would have opted to make his feathers be perfectly still instead of... Uh, this. Speaking of character models, characters like Knights, Riala, and all the other creative characters in the Nightmarins, they all look really good and perfectly fine. As for Will and Helen, though, yeah, I don't know. They, they, they certainly don't look terrible or anything, but they... Uh, they could have used some work. Their faces don't really seem to emote, like, at all. And I don't know if it's just me, but it looks like they were both dunked in a tank of shellac varnish. Cause, my god are they shiny. Again, I have no clue what kind of constraints Sonic Team was under when they were making this game, because while the levels and some characters look really good, especially for Wii standards, others are just... huh. 
Wow, really, guys? Uh, anyway. Speaking of the kids, you have several opportunities to play as them, either by roaming the small hub world where there admittedly isn't much to do beyond collect a couple of secrets. You can also play as them during the opening levels where you climb up the chain to play as knights, much like the first game. Again, there really isn't much to do as the children other than just look around, but some secrets may be hidden there, so I guess there is that. One other thing you can do that I neglected to mention even in the first game was that as the kids, Elliot and Claris, and even knights should you get close enough, is you can interact with the little Nightopians and even hatch some of the eggs. I can sort of explain this. If any of you at all are familiar with the chow raising sort of minigame from the Sonic Adventure games, it's very loosely related to this, but not nearly as well implemented. Even the first Knights game had something like this, but it was so obtuse and I frankly would be stunned if anybody at all actually knew how it worked, because it was almost 100% pointless, and sadly, Journey of Dreams doesn't make much of an improvement on it. Hell, like I said, I forgot to even mention it in the first game because I forgot it was even there. You can see their names and carry them around and even throw orbs at them, but none of this seems to make any difference or contribute to anything noticeable or worth your time for that matter. And while we're on the subject, being that this was a Nintendo Wii game and Nintendo was trying to take advantage of the Wi-Fi online capabilities of gaming, Night's Journey of Dreams sort of attempts to do this too. After you play a few levels, your character gets access to their own online dream space where it will start off blank and empty, but over the course of repeat playthroughs of the game, more and more objects, Nightopians and even small nightmarins will start appearing in your dream space. Sadly people, this ain't no Animal Crossing. There is just about nothing you can do to shape how your dream looks. Well, nothing that's in your control anyway. But once upon a time, you could invite other players to come into your dream where you could do absolutely nothing together and just roam around and not even be able to communicate. Yeah, I really have no idea what the hell Sega was thinking with this. It's so bare bones and worthless, and I would have honestly forgiven most of it if you could at least talk to the other players, but you don't even have that option. So aside from trying to collect the secret item located in here, the online dream world is a barren wasteland of wasted opportunity. Well, luckily there is another Wi-Fi option, where you can race another player to the finish as either Knights or Riala, so hey, that's something at least. Too bad the servers are long gone, but hey, we still got local versus if you guys feel up to the two-player challenge. Oh yeah, speaking of versus, the bosses are an interesting bunch. Overall, they are very similar to the boss fights in the original game. I mean, you got the giant fish, you got Puffy and Don Villain, who are pretty much identical. There's the Kaking Chameleon boss fight, whom, despite having a bit of a luck RNG thing going on in his fight, I actually find it kind of fun. Cerberus, the Hellhound, is a short fight, but it can be tricky if you're not quick. There's the Queen Bella boss fight, where you have to knock out the platform she's standing on. But the absolute worst boss, in my opinion, is the Bamamba fight with the cats. Oh my god. Trying to complete this fight in a timely manner is a goddamn nightmare. Get this, the object is to try and rotate the platform so that you can get these cats to roll into balls and fall down into these holes. It sounds simple, but simple and easy are two different things, guys. And this is not as easy as it may look. The amount of repeats I did on this boss just to get a satisfying rank annoyed the ever-living hell out of me. Thankfully, this is the worst of it. During the story at one point, Knights challenges Riala head-on and defeats him. Riala's boss fight is similar to his original encounter, but this time it's about grabbing the rotating bombs and hurling them back and forth at each other until one of you drops. As the game comes to a head, Wiseman himself appears and captures Knights as well as drops Helen into the void. Will sees this happen and gives chase after them. It's here that both kids finally have an inner monologue accepting their responsibilities and recognize that without knights to hold their hand, they have to step up and save him. And thus... And I have to help them. <laughs> oh yeah, this is actually really cool. I know this technically happened with Elliot and Claris as well, but seeing these two kids finally take charge and fly about the city on their own with the awesome Knights music in the background is... I'm... It, hey, it's hype. That's all I can say. It's hype. 
But just when you are really starting to get into it, suddenly Wiseman cuts Helen off and shrouds her in darkness, which sadly forces her to lose her idea of courage. If I've said it once, I'll say it a thousand times more. Sega may not be perfect, but goddamn if they don't have a team of musical composers that know what the hell they are doing. The badass remix of the Dreams Dreams theme playing while the heroes fly towards the bell tower to rescue knights is unironically one of my favorite gaming moments. And I've played a lot of games. Seriously, though. I haven't even talked about the soundtrack, but I'll just say it. No matter what criticisms or disdain you could possibly have for this game, should any exist at all, the Knight's Journey of Dreams soundtrack is, not kidding, one of the best video game soundtracks I've ever come across. It's been over a decade since this game was released, and I still find just about every single track on this three-disc soundtrack lit as hell. I'll, I'll try not to make this section long, but... I have a real appreciation for music, and I can't just let good pieces go under the radar. So just listen to some of these snippets from some of my favorite tracks. Come on, man. If nothing else, the music alone is worth the price of admission. Especially the badassery going on here as we're trying to save knights. Once the kids make it to the top, they do unleash knights, but Riala isn't having any of it. Before he kills the kids, gee, yeah, it got dark all of a sudden. Shit. Knights wants to put a stop to Riala once and for all. You and me, one on one. <laughs> You're on. I'll make sure that you're in no shape to get in my way ever again. I'll deliver your heads to Master Wiseman myself. <laughs> Knights does prove to be too much for Riala to handle, and then the final showdown commences. The group appear at first to be determined to defeat the God of Nightmare, 
But then he drops this bombshell on them that should they succeed in killing him, Knights, because he was once a Nightmarin, would ultimately perish with Wiseman. It's because of this that the kids hesitate because they don't want to lose their friend, but Knights knew that this would happen all along and planned for it. Will, it's okay. We need to protect your dreams. Knights, it'll be all right. No matter what happens, we'll be friends forever. Isn't that right, Helen? Come on, let's show him what our courage can do. With that, utilizing all the Persona masks, all three of them take down Wiseman, regain the idea of hope, and Knights gives his last send-off. The kids both wake up in tears at the loss of Knights, but do realize that they have to live for themselves and hope for the future. Will learns to rely on his own inner strength, but his father shows up anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, I guess he kind of lucked out on that one. He makes the victory goal, and all is well. Helen manages to make the show on time, where she and her mother play a very charming sonata piece and get the applause. And the final scene ends with our two lead kids actually getting the chance to meet in the real world. <sighs> Nights into Dreams was a very simple game when you got down to it. It had five levels, you flew around in a controlled environment, flying through rings and earning a high score. You had a game manual and a few cutscenes with no dialogue to piece it all together, and the game's biggest selling point was being able to fly. On any other day, especially by 2007 standards, a game like this would have flopped hard. And then, Sega was tasked by fans to create a sequel in modern times that kept the soul of what made the first game so appealing. Did Sega succeed? Well, you'll find the answers to be quite polarizing. Nintendo certainly thought Sega did a great job as they gave the game a whopping 9 out of 10 on Nintendo Power, and while other critics like Electronic Monthly gave it a fairly positive review, they did share some of the same criticisms that I had but definitely harped on the poor motion controls. Yeah, that, as, <laughs> that is actually one thing that I really didn't go over. When the game was announced, it was hyped around the gimmick that you could use the Wii Remote to fly instead of the standard controller. However, this was back before even the Wii Motion Plus was around, so you can imagine how well this actually worked out. Bottom line, it didn't. The Wii Remote would constantly lose focus on the screen, and Knights wasn't nearly as responsive as he should have been with it. But, thankfully, by use of the Nunchuck or the GameCube controller, the gimmick was mercifully something you didn't need to use. Other critics tended to be all over the place with this game. There was plenty who gave the game positive feedback, understanding what it was trying to be from the start and not expecting it to be anything more. Others, in spite of praising the elements that were shining examples like the visual spectacle and the music, couldn't really get into what Knights was all about, claiming it was really only for those who were already invested in the character to begin with. And newcomers probably wouldn't find much here since, in truth, Journey of Dreams was, by design, trying to remain as faithful to its Sega Saturn predecessor as it could, even by Takashi Izuka's own admission, since he returned to be the lead director. However, considering that Knight's Journey of Dreams wasn't a AAA game from the start, it still sold well enough, and or at least within reason, and hey, it didn't bomb. So that's a good thing. And even now, Knight's fans as well as Takashi Izuka himself have stated that he would love to work on another Knight's game if he was ever given the opportunity. 
as for me, I am right up there with the rest of them. While Night's Journey of Dreams is a flawed game, that is, without question, clinging onto the past and doing not a whole lot to advance the series in a direction I think it would need to survive in today's modern gaming world, I still was pleasantly surprised at how much magic and inspiration I was able to see in this small game. It's a simple story with simple gameplay, but it's rich with lore and I can tell the people working on it actually did put some effort and heart into it. It may have been fueled with nostalgia, but for me, that wasn't really a problem. However, I do think it's true. This game was made for fans of knights who desperately wanted to see the purple hero in action again. Not all Knights fans may have been happy with what they got, but I for one do think that Journey of Dreams is a much better game than the original, in just about every conceivable way. Do not at me, you know it to be true. As much as I still love the original game, I can't understand why some of the more elitist fans can't see how the sequel actually improved upon, even if by a little, the shortcomings the first game had. Nostalgia, guys, it's a hell of a drug. But hey, if you do manage to collect all 60 of the dream drops that are hidden throughout the game, you can even jump in the new rainbow fountain in the hub world and even play as Elliot and Claris from the original game. Their use is just about the same as Will and Helen, but hey, that's something. So if you've come along this far, dear viewer, first of all, thank you so much for sticking with me as I ramble about this decade old game that time may have forgotten. And second, I hope this review slash retrospective of the Knights games has given you some insight and has encouraged you to try these games out. Because honestly, there is no other series I can think of that is like Knights. While it certainly has conflict, it's probably one of the most serene games out there that doesn't put an emphasis on violence and over the top action to engage its audience. And that alone I think is what drew me towards it and I respect it that much more for trying something different, and, in general, just being very imaginative. After all, imagination is where this game originally stemmed from, and I love that it's managed to maintain its roots in that and not trying to appeal to the mass market of gamers who demand high-octane thrills. And while this isn't the last we've seen of Knights, he's made other appearances since then in other games and comics and media, I wouldn't be lying if I said that the ending of Journey of Dreams, with Knights waving goodbye at the audience, actually felt bittersweet and kind of conclusive. Hopefully this is not the case. Sega is still alive and well, and if Sonic the Hedgehog can have a series of failures and still manage to land back on his feet, I don't see any reason why Knights can't gain another boost of momentum as well. Because I think Knights' Journey of Dreams is actually good.